Well, good morning. How are we, guys? Yeah. All right. If we haven't met yet, my name is Brandon. I'm one of the pastors here. If we have met, my name is also Brandon. That's for you, Katie Coleman. That's an inside joke between us. Uh, this summer, we are in a series called Jesus And, where we're looking at different interactions Jesus had with people. And last week, my friend Ant from our Two Notch Church preached here, and that was wonderful. Uh, we don't invite him to preach here often because we don't want y'all thinking less of us, so... <laughs> We can let him come every once in a while, you know. If you have a Bible, go ahead and go to Luke chapter 5. Uh, go ahead and turn there. And while you're turning, I'd love to, to pray for our time this morning. Uh, Father, thank you for the privilege of getting to open your word and uh, look at what um, you have to say to us. I pray that you would speak uh, through your spirit and through your word this morning in ways that only you can. Uh, I know that I have nothing to sustain the souls of those gathered here, so I pray that you would speak and move and, and act and work. And uh, thank you uh, for what you've done uh, to pursue us and our rebellion against you, uh, to come after us, uh, to love us, to care for us, and to save us. And I pray that you would center our hearts and our minds and our attention on you this morning, uh, get rid of any distractions that we walked in here with, and help us to, uh, to see you more clearly. I uh, thank you for Jesus. We love you. Amen. All right. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about Jesus and the outcast. Uh, I'm not referencing the hip hop duo of yesteryear. I don't, to my knowledge, I don't think there are any recorded interactions between Jesus and Andre 3000 or Big Boy. If there were, I'd be very eager to read them, just for the record. But and we're talking about someone who feels rejected by society, someone who, for one reason or another, has found themselves isolated from others and doesn't have a place that they belong. Jesus interacted with many people who would fit into that category, but we get a beautifully clear picture of his heart toward the outcast uh, in this quick interaction from Luke chapter 5. So we'll start in verse 12. It says, While he was in one of the cities, he being Jesus, there came a man full of leprosy. So Jesus is traveling from city to city, preaching and ministering, and a leper approaches him. And leprosy is a skin disease that still exists to this day, though it is much less of an issue now than it was then. And when you contract leprosy, sores open all over your body, often very painful sores. But leprosy isn't just a skin-deep issue. As the condition worsens over time, the damage becomes serious because leprosy affects your nerves as well. And the nerve damage is what makes leprosy so dangerous. Over time, you start to lose feeling in the areas affected. You lose feeling in your hands or feet. And the result is that if you hurt yourself, you don't feel it. Eventually, the result is the crippling of your hands and feet, the shortening or loss of affected fingers and toes, paralysis, or blindness. In Jesus' time, leprosy was not just a physical condition. It was also a social condition because it was not just a disease. It was a dreaded, contagious disease that was directly connected to your social standing in life. There were specific rules for how leprosy was supposed to be treated and dealt with, as we see in Leviticus 13. This reference will be on the screen. The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of his face, and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. So if you had this condition, you had to live alone. And if you ever came into contact with anyone else, you'd have to literally scream, unclean, unclean, and when you got near them. Many people believed you could not let a leper into your house or your house would become contaminated with a disease. You wouldn't want to walk where a leper had just walked because of what it might do to you. You could only imagine the effects, the social, psychological, spiritual, emotional effects of this on someone's life. You certainly couldn't go to the temple to worship. And this is not remotely the same thing, okay? But just to try to make a connection. Do you remember the early days in the pandemic? 
the way that you would feel if you got diagnosed with COVID? I got it a few times because that's how I roll, you guys. And boy, did I dread those phone calls or texts, let me tell you. Like uh, calling up someone and be like, hey, friend, uh, we're still friends, right? Just, just checking, just make sure. Because you remember earlier today when we were eating lunch in the office and, you know, we were respectfully distanced and all, but remember when I like sneezed on the table? And I said, don't worry, it was just allergies. It wasn't just allergies. Are we still friends? Or you get back out of quarantine, just so thankful to see other humans, and they'd be like, oh, good, it's good to see you again. I'm going to walk away from you now, and actually, I have to leave right now. That feeling is like one one thousandth of what these people likely felt. And man, when you have a family with four young kids like we do, you don't need a pandemic. Getting the flu or the stomach bug sets off flashing red lights of dread in our house. Like kid one gets it and doesn't sleep. Kid two gets it and doesn't sleep. Adult one gets it and leaves the other with two sick kids and two stir crazy kids. And you're trying to keep them away from each other, which is impossible. And then sometimes both adults get it at the same time, at which point you just have to play rock, paper, scissors for who gets to be sick. (laughs) And the other one doesn't get to. It doesn't matter what your body's doing. You don't get to be sick. So there's a minuscule way we can feel this isolation, even in our own families, when someone gets sick and everyone else sees the movie of the next month play out and is like, you stay away from me, you contaminated bringer of misery into our home. Like I said, not remotely the same thing, but the seed is there. When something happens to you and you suddenly realize others would probably prefer to be very, very far from you so as not to be contaminated by you. In a world of pre-modern medical care, this is logical to a certain extent. The important part was not spreading it, and they didn't know everything about how to treat or prevent it. So some of the things that feel mean were more so just realities for them, things that people had to live with. If you had leprosy for the sake of others, you had to scream unclean anytime you got near someone and watch them scurry away. You felt like The plague, because in a very real sense, you had a plague, a very unfortunate and heartbreaking one. And some people added insult to injury, literally, by wrongly assuming that all lepers were cursed by God for sin in their life. So sometimes when they needed compassion, they didn't receive it. So when this man approaches Jesus, he's not only coming to him as a sick man, he is coming to him as the walking definition of an outcast. Just think, like, how long had it been since he'd had a normal face-to-face conversation with someone other than someone else with leprosy? How long do you think it had been since anyone had ever touched this man? It may have been years or possibly even decades to to be, quote, full of leprosy means his condition was advanced. He'd been in this state for a long time. If he had a family, how long had it been since he had hugged his wife, since he'd felt his kids run to embrace him? How painstakingly lonely this man must have felt. He was used to people running from him, never walking toward him. Every moment of his day is a constant reminder of this. To live his life, you'd have had to walk around with an incredibly deep sense of shame. Being an outcast and experiencing shame are connected deeply. And in this case, this man, his shame was likely both internal and social. There were constant reminders that there was something wrong with him, something that made others recoil from him. But leprosy isn't the only thing that leads to the type of feelings he must have felt. There are all sorts of things that we feel shame about that lead us to isolation, where we start to feel like an outcast in some ways. I'll briefly mention three ways, three reasons we can feel like outcasts. Number one, because of who we are. Anything that causes you to feel less than. So Maybe it's how you look. You don't feel like you fit the bill. You don't feel like you fit the standards of attractiveness set by whatever time and place you find yourself born into. Maybe you feel less than the other kids at school who are more popular or smarter than you. Maybe because of your circumstances. Maybe you were fired or dropped out of a school or program you cared about. Maybe you have a medical diagnosis that just feels very isolating. Maybe it's the feeling of being picked last in some form or fashion. 
That could be you're in middle school and literally getting picked last for a sport, or that could be, it's been decades since you've been in middle school, but there's still this area of your life that feels that way. Like you were the last one to get picked or chosen or whatever, and it doesn't feel any better now than it did then. Maybe you feel less than because of your family history. Maybe you come from a family with all sorts of brokenness. Divorce, abandonment, adultery, addiction, relational breakdown. Maybe in your hopeless moments, you wonder if you are bound to make the same mistakes that are found littered throughout your family tree. And it's only a matter of time before you succumb to what has happened before you. Secondly, because of what we've done, because of mistakes or sins in our past that we may, may feel stained or marks, uh, marked us. It's this feeling of, there's just something wrong with me. I'm cursed. God can't forgive me. I can't forgive myself. This could come from overtly sinful things or just a costly mistake or error that you made. Sometimes shame about our past will sound like, I'm so stupid. Why did I do that? What is wrong with me? Or maybe it's just things you struggle with, like struggling to keep up in school or at work, feeling like you're a bad parent or spouse or friend because you sinned against someone or failed to meet expectations. Third, because of what's been done to us. Any sense of rejection can bring a, a sense of shame. Maybe you were rejected or abandoned by your, your parents or by your peers. Maybe you were bullied in middle or high school rejected by a romantic interest. Something happened in your past that leads to self-talk that says, no one would ever love me, date me, be my friend, want to be around me, etc. Any abuse creates a sense of feeling like there's something wrong with us. The message abuse carries as, I don't deserve to be loved. I deserve to be hated, mistreated. The reality is many of us have something that makes us feel like an outcast. We have moments where we feel ashamed. There are things about us that just make us cringe a little bit. There's something we feel deep shame over that pushes us into hiding. And at times we can feel a little bit like this leper. Yet Jesus has great news for this man who was full of leprosy and likely full of shame. We'll pick back up in verse 12 in the story. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Like, I wonder what the scene actually felt like. We know Jesus was often surrounded by people and crowds as he ministered and taught. You can imagine there was a crowded scene, people all around Jesus. And then this man, if he followed the Old Testament codes, maybe off in the distance, you hear someone walking and saying, unclean, unclean. And the voice gets louder and louder as it gets closer and the crowd parts because no one wants to be near him. And here's this man described as full of leprosy and he staggers forward and he falls on his knees and everyone scurries away from him except for Jesus. And you can hear the shame in his statement even. Listen to what he says. He says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Please help me. I know you can. And think about what he says here. This man does not doubt whether or not Jesus has the power to make him clean. He declares it to be true. What he doubts is if anybody would be willing to help him. Verse 13, And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. So instead of turning from him, Jesus turns to him. Not only does he turn to him, but he reaches out his hand and touches the man for the first time in who knows how long. And don't miss the beauty in this picture right here. When you touch a leper, you defile yourself. You run the risk of taking his leprosy upon yourself. And this act was something that would have caused everyone around to raise their eyebrows and drop their jaws. Jesus doesn't just keep his hands behind his back and say, okay, be clean. And he totally could have done that easily. He does that in many other recorded healings. Instead, he reaches out through the distance and touches this diseased, shamed, isolated man to heal him. You can imagine the shock on this guy's face as, as Jesus touches his skin. 
everyone has recoiled and ran from him for so long. And now somebody is reaching his hand out, touching him. And he says, I am willing, be clean. In this moment, the leper realizes that Jesus is willing to risk taking his defilement upon himself in order that he might be made clean. And immediately this man is healed from full of leprosy to leprosy free in an instant. A wild miracle. And if that were the entire story, we'd probably be okay with it. Jesus does the miracle. The outcast leper isn't a leper anymore. Sweet. But you can't miss what happens next either in verse 14. It says, And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. (coughs) Jesus basically tells this man, you've been healed, now you need to obey the Bible. What he's referring to here when he mentions Moses is the Old Testament. The first five books were written by Moses, and here Jesus is going back to Leviticus 14. And that chapter gives details and instructions for someone who has experienced an alleged healing from leprosy. It's very extensive. The leper would meet with the priest, the leader and mediator between God and the people, and they would meet somewhere outside the city. And the priest would come to him to verify the healing of the leper. And if the leper had proven to be healed, the priest would declare to the community that he or she had been healed. And then what would happen is if someone was in fact healed from leprosy is they'd take two birds. They'd sacrifice one and release the other, showing that blood had to be spilt to forgive and cleanse the man and that the other bird would fly away, symbolizing that his sins had been carried away for good. And the person would have to bathe because the rules said so, but also because it might have been a while since they had a bath. They would be shaved. Usually they had long, scraggly, unkempt hair. So they would be shaved and they would shave their whole body, including their eyebrows. They would be made clean, made new. And then what would happen is that they would be welcomed back home. There would be a week-long party where he's or she are restored to the community. Can you, can you imagine what that might have felt like for this man? If he was married when he got leprosy, can you imagine the reunion moment here? Like, you know those videos of, of soldiers who come home unexpectedly to meet their wife and kids, the ones that make your eyes wet somehow? That's the feel here. Except there's a deep removal of shame that comes along with it. He's able to hug his wife, hold her hand, eat a meal beside her. He's restored to his children if he has them. He feels the little arms hugged around his neck. Word makes it back to his community. He's been healed. God did a miracle. His leprosy is is gone. Praise God, let's throw a party. And then he who was once separated and shunned is now welcomed with open arms, restored to his community. Jesus' instructions to this man are not some cold religious rules for him to follow, but rather a means for him to be fully embraced by his community. And then at the end of that week-long celebration that would follow this process, the person would bathe yet again, and they would shave yet again, showing full and total healing and cleansing and forgiveness. And then the priest would take three lambs and offer three lambs for sacrifice, lambs without spot or blemish. Does any of that sound familiar? The redemption of someone ostracized through the shedding of blood, the party over one who was defiled with a lifelong condition, being made clean, the bringing of one who was far away near. Hopefully it does sound familiar to you because in the gospel, this is what happens for all of us. His leprosy is a microcosm for our sin, our shame, our separation from God and others, our hopelessness, our sure decay, if not for the intervening grace of God. However much you feel or don't feel like an outcast because of who you are, what you've done, or what's been done to you, the reality is that spiritually speaking, you are one. I am one. Apart from Christ, we are this leper, unable to approach God because we're unclean and full of sin. The Bible says we've all fallen short. We've all sinned, and all of our best works are like filthy rags. We cannot fix what's wrong with us. Our 
only hope is to fall before him in desperation, to stumble on our face like this man and beg for him to heal us. And just like the leper, he does. And he goes above and beyond. In your shame, he lays his hand on you and he says, be healed. This touch is so important because it's personal, it's intimate, it's meaningful. He says, you're mine. I love you. I've seen who you are, what you've done, what's happened to you. Be healed. He cleanses us from our sin and our shame, but he doesn't leave the outcast alone either. He brings us into a family. Through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, we are made right with God. Our sin is crucified with Christ. We're cleansed and clothed in Jesus' spotless righteousness. And then we're led by God into this family of believers who've all experienced the exact same forgiveness and cleansing and healing. The outcasts receive a family. The formerly shameful receive forgiveness and cleansing. Our sin caused a proximity problem. It alienates us from God and it isolates us from other people. We can't draw near to God and we don't want to draw near to others because sin makes us hide and withdraw. And Jesus, through the astounding act of the incarnation, pursues us, draws near to us. He does everything necessary to cleanse, heal, forgive, restore us. He becomes the outcast himself as he was turned upon, abandoned by his friends and his people, brought outside the city walls to be murdered like the undesirables of their society. He knows scorn and shame and pain and alienation by experience, and he endured all of that for you and for me. He deals with our proximity problem by covering all of the distance between us and him. And then he goes and deals with our proximity problem with others by calling us all out of our hiding places and making us a family of redeemed son and daughters. And just think of how that transforms us. We can now begin to be honest, transparent, because there's no reason for all the hiding. We can bring our sin and our shame to Jesus, no matter what kind it is, because he draws near instead of pulling away. He heals and forgives and cleanses. Shame lives on secrecy and privacy, but where you've got a community of people who live authentically before Jesus with honesty, loving each other the way he's loved us, shame can't survive there. It can't survive in loving light. And to be known at your worst and still loved will change your entire life. There is joy and freedom there that many people never taste. And that is what available, is available to all of us as God's people. So I don't know at the end of the day how this may strike you or what connection you may feel to this man. Maybe you've done some stuff in your past that you feel like is some degree of unforgivable. And you're embarrassed and you're thinking, maybe how could I ever tell anyone about this? Maybe you feel like a failure in some sense. You can't get it right at home or at work or in relationships, in your marriage, in your parenting. You keep struggling with your walk with Jesus. Maybe you feel like you don't fit in for some reason, like you don't belong wherever it is that you would like to belong. Maybe you've been hurt and rejected by others just one too many times. And that's led to a deep sense of shame that you don't know what to do with. The good news is you're not the first to feel that way. You're not the only one who feels that way, probably even in this room. And you won't be the last to feel that way. But the even better news is that Jesus reaches through all of that distance, whatever it is that's there. He reaches all the way to the very core of whatever brings you shame, whatever makes you feel isolated, contaminated, defective, untouchable. He takes your sin and your shame onto himself. He cleanses and heals you. And then he has a plan for the power of your shame to be broken through community. Just like with this man, he heals us spiritually. And then he says, now go obey the Bible. Because the commands to confess and walk in the light with others are not cold religious rules, but are meant for your restoration and your freedom. So this morning, I just invite us all to see this picture of Jesus. To see him reaching out through the hot Middle Eastern air of a normal day. To place his hand on this man who likely flinched 
at the radical act of mercy he was receiving. And know that Jesus reaches out to you as well with the same love, the same warmth, the same kindness on his face, the same stunning mercy that would endanger himself to save you. Jesus became an outcast so that you'd never have to be one again.